Imagine a time when your neighbors could accuse you of witchcraft, leading to your execution. No evidence, no proof, just fear and paranoia. This is what life was like in Salem, Massachusetts, during the infamous Salem Witch Trials of 1692. Innocent people, mostly women, were caught in a wave of hysteria that swept through the Puritan settlement. How did such a horrific event unfold in a small, devout community? And what led to the panic that turned neighbor against neighbor? In this documentary, we'll uncover the causes of the Salem Witch Trials, examine the hysteria that spread like wildfire, and explore the tragic consequences of one of America's darkest moments. 2. Setting the Stage, Colonial America and Puritan Life The Salem Witch Trials didn't happen in isolation. To understand the chaos that would grip Salem in 1692, we first need to understand the society that gave birth to such fear. Puritan New England in the late 17th century was a deeply religious community. The Puritans, who had fled religious persecution in England, sought to create a city upon a hill, a model of Christian purity. In this world, everything was black and white. God was always watching, and so was the devil. Any deviation from strict moral codes was seen as a threat to the community, a sign that Satan was at work. Add to this the harsh realities of colonial life, disease, crop failures, and constant threats from Native American tribes, and you have a community living in fear and anxiety. 3. The Spark, Strange Behavior in Salem Village The events leading up to the Salem Witch Trials began in early 1692. In Salem Village, a small, tight-knit community near the larger Salem town, a group of young girls began exhibiting strange behaviors. They screamed, convulsed, and contorted their bodies in unnatural ways. The local doctor, unable to explain these symptoms, concluded that the girls must be under the influence of witchcraft. These afflicted girls, including the niece and daughter of Salem's minister Samuel Paris, began naming people they believed were witches. Among the first to be accused was Tituba, an enslaved woman of indigenous and African descent who worked in the Paris household. Tituba, likely under pressure, confessed to practicing witchcraft and claimed there were other witches working in Salem. 4. Fear spreads, the accusations multiply. Once the first accusations were made, the panic spread quickly. Neighbors began accusing neighbors. People who had long-standing grudges or disputes saw an opportunity to rid themselves of their enemies. What started as a small incident in one household became a community-wide hysteria. Over the next few months, more than 200 people were accused of witchcraft. The accused were often marginalized individuals, widows, women with few children, or those who didn't conform to the strict expectations of Puritan society. But it wasn't just the outcasts, upstanding members of the community also found themselves caught in the web of suspicion. Once accused, it was almost impossible to prove your innocence. The logic was twisted, if you denied being a witch, you were lying, if you confessed, it confirmed the community's fears. 5. The Trials, A Mockery of Justice In the summer of 1692, the trials began. Special courts were established to hear the cases, and one of the most notorious was the Court of Voyer and Termine, headed by the infamous Judge Samuel Sewell. The legal process was deeply flawed. Spectral evidence, testimony based on dreams and visions, was allowed in court. If someone claimed to see a witch's spirit tormenting them in a dream, that was considered valid evidence. Many of the accused were forced to confess under duress or threat of execution. Twenty people were executed, nineteen were hanged, and one man, Giles Corey, was pressed to death with heavy stones for refusing to enter a plea. The youngest person accused was just five years old, and while she wasn't executed, she was imprisoned. 6. The End of the Trials, Reason Prevails by the end of 1692, the hysteria had begun to die down. Prominent ministers like Increase Mather and Cotton Mather, who had initially supported the trials, began to question the legitimacy of the accusations and the use of spectral evidence. 
public opinion turned against the trials, and by 1693, the governor of Massachusetts, William Phipps, dissolved the court of Oyer and Termonet and halted the executions. In the years that followed, many of the judges and jurors involved in the trials expressed regret for their actions. Samuel Sewell, one of the key judges, publicly apologized for his role in the executions. The government of Massachusetts also offered compensation to the families of the victims, though this came too late to undo the damage. 7. The Aftermath, Lessons Learned The Salem Witch Trials left a lasting scar on American history. They are a tragic reminder of the dangers of mass hysteria, scapegoating, and the abuse of power. But they also sparked changes in the way we think about justice. The trials raised questions about the reliability of evidence, due process, and the importance of a fair legal system. For centuries, the trials have served as a cautionary tale. They show how fear can cloud reason and how quickly a society can turn on its own when gripped by paranoia. 8. Salem Today, Remembering the Victims Today, the town of Salem is known more for its infamous past than for anything else. Visitors from around the world come to learn about the trials, visit the sites where the accused were imprisoned and executed, and pay their respects to the victims. In 1992, the state of Massachusetts officially declared the 300th anniversary of the trials as a time of remembrance, and a memorial was established to honor those who were wrongfully accused and executed. The Salem Witch Trials may be a dark chapter in American history, but they also remind us of the importance of protecting individual rights and resisting the forces of fear and hysteria.